This is Comic Geek Speak episode 1751, Comic Talk. I'm Adam Murdo. I'm Ian Levenstein. And I'm Chris Everly. Welcome uh, back, so one so and all. Good to be back. Yes. <laughs> We're back from our brief uh, hiatus, which was due to all kinds of logistical mishaps. But, ladies and gentlemen, it's damn good to be here. Mm. Yes, it is. Amen, amen. Glad, glad we had a crisis tapes to fill the gap. Oh, talk about filling the gap. <laughs> that filled up the trench on the Western Front. Murr, that is a master class, my friend. <laughs> master class. Thank you kindly, Chris. Peter and I uh, enjoyed getting back in the saddle and uh, you know, climbing into the uh, uh, swivel chair at the monitor satellite and uh, delivering some more crisis content here in uh, the, the 10th anniversary year of the crisis tapes. Yes, Incredible. indeed. I love I love Bird. I usually work a six to seven hour work day uh, for my part timer, and uh, that that wound up uh, doing the entire back half of my day, just sitting there listening to the to the crisis tapes. And before I knew it, the work day was over. Mm. Yeah, now, don't you usually uh, take long walks around the city while listening to those uh, you know big mammoth episodes that we sometimes produce? When I'm in Manhattan, I I do. Yeah, but uh, this 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 worked nicely as uh, as good background material as I was uh, entering uh, products into a database. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I've done my share of data entry too, and I know the importance of having some good listening material. So thank you for choosing Crisis Tapes for your sanity preservation needs. You are quite welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So plenty of stuff to discuss and plenty of stuff has oh, happened yeah. over the last couple of weeks, guys. Uh, where do you want to start? Why don't we start with your con report, sir? Sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, the big the big one happened uh, this uh, this past uh, uh, two weeks ago now. Uh, hard to believe it's been two weeks. Uh, but uh, New York Comic Con, I've been going ever since it started. Uh, so this is, I think, my 13th, if I'm, if I'm doing the math correctly. Uh, New York Comic Con in a row, and uh, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger every single year. Uh, even mm-hmm. even when they take out half of the uh, of the Javits Center due to due to construction, they still find a way to make it huge. And uh, mm-hmm. that's that's what they've been doing the past uh, past couple of years. And now they're doing a lot more offsite stuff, and it's just mm-hmm. growing and growing and growing. Mm-hmm. Now, the last time I was there, they were uh, constructing kind of a light rail setup um, uh, uh, with service to the uh, to the Javits Center. Have they completed that? Uh, so w- what you're thinking of is uh, known as the 7 train extension. Um, so it actually uh, ran the 7 train from its what was originally its final stop at 42nd Street to right by Hudson Yards, which is like a half a block away from the Javits Center. So now you can just take the 7 train all the way from Queens straight to the Javits Center. That's its official final stop. So that's uh, that's what uh, a lot of people get to do these days uh, when uh, when heading to the Javits. It makes it a lot easier. Convenient. Mm-hmm. So, Ian, my, my question is, because I haven't gone to the show in years because I just got – I got too middle-aged and it got too crowded. <laughs> um, what What is the vibe now? Because are comics receding more and more? Uh, you know, surprisingly not. Um, oh, okay. I, I feel like I feel like there are uh, tons of different ways to still have a comic book experience at New York Comic Con, just like there is with San Diego. It's just you need to just separate yourself from the the media insanity on parts of the floor, um, and then there's still going to be tons of panels uh, that are that are right up your alley. The way that I did that to start was on Thursday. Uh, they were running uh, mostly for librarians, but also just in general for professionals. They were running panels out of the New York Public Library on Thursday, um, oh. and they had a whole bunch of uh, a more you know subdued conversation esque uh, 
panels being run out of there. Uh, the first one that I went to was a graphic orientalism, de- deconstructing Asian identity in comics. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And it, it had a it had a, a really awesome panel. Um, actually, a uh, a family friend of my uh, well, actually not family friend, uh, family of my girlfriend, uh, a uh, a cousin of hers, uh, uh, Anna Coates, was on the panel. So that's one of the reasons that I attended. Uh, she's a librarian in New Jersey, uh, so she went ahead and uh, and gave her insight, uh, along with uh, Caroline Hong, uh, Crystal Chen, uh, Preeti uh, Ch- uh, Chebert, uh, Riki Yohiko, and Susan Chi. And it didn't just focus on, you know, what we would consider, in, in, for the most part, in our part of the world, Asian, but also touched on Indian culture and, and things along those lines and how uh, there really isn't a lot of it in comics. But, the, mm. but what is there um, is greater today than it ever was, and it's definitely increasing over time. Um, and I think that that's actually really important uh, for, you know, for identity's sake um, in comics, you know, like... Uh, uh, people people forget that there's as large of an Indian presence as there is in the United States, uh, specifically in New York. And oh God, yeah. And where do all the superheroes live? <laughs> you know, so it just makes it just makes a lot more sense for the for you know more characters along those lines to be showing up, and 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 we're getting there even in Miss Marvel and stuff like that. So now, do they revisit some of the many? tropes and stereotypes of you know the gold and silver and even bronze ages when it came to asian characters are more like kind of a look forward um they, they touched a little bit on that uh mostly a look forward but they did also discuss the fact that we've come leaps and bounds on on asian characters since you know mm. they were originally introduced in comics you know the uh you know the, the you know the yellow scare has very much changed <laughs> uh from from that time to now uh, Actually, Ian, because I, I have to be my irritating uh, history person, it's the Yellow Peril. Yellow, yellow Peril, right. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate the correction, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, yes uh, you know the the days of Shu and his offspring. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and even the Yellow Claw and all that jazz. Like it's you know <laughs> th- th- things have most definitely changed, mostly for the better uh, since that time. And and they went into that in in, in good detail. It was a very informative, uh, interesting panel to start off the day while i was there uh they wound up doing uh a panel first second had a non-fiction comics panel at the, oh, New, at the wow. New York public library uh science comics maker comics history comics and world citizen comics oh fantastic yeah and and that was that was really really good uh bob garfield uh is a npr personality uh that i know t- i know i've heard of him sure yeah he he actually ran the panel um, and, uh, you know, as the moderator, cause he's got, uh, some, uh, I believe some, uh, some hi- like history of democracy comics coming out of first second, uh, that he's helping out with. So he, he went ahead and, uh, and moderated the panel for everybody else. And it was, it was a, it was a very, uh, very interesting look at things, uh, learned a bit more about, uh, you know, some food comics that I didn't know about before and the, demo- the, as for mentioned, uh, you know, democracy comics and, uh, some, you know, how to comics that, uh, first seconds putting out, uh, that were all pretty cool. Um, and it was a nice chill way to start off my, uh, my Thursday. Like they had, uh, Amy's mm-hmm. bread provided, uh, vegetarian food for everybody who attended, uh, in the uh, lounge area and, uh, Right before I left, there was a uh, a conversation going on between Majoring Lou and I'm um, blanking on the name of the artist, but uh, uh, on Monstrous, uh, you know the uh, the comic out of uh, out of Image, uh, Sana Takeda is the name of the artist. Uh, she unfo- she doesn't actually speak English very well, so it was mostly through an interpreter, uh, which threw off the vibe of the panel a little bit for me, just because there was a lot of you know like waiting for responses and what have you. Um, but, uh, that was the, uh, the other one that I, that I attended while I was there and overall just a, a nice way to start things off. And to, again, to answer your question again, Chris, like that's, if you're looking for like more scholarly, like comic book conversation and you're there on a Thursday, that's absolutely the way to do it. I, that's, I'm glad to hear that. So this was not in the Javits and you went to the library, you're saying? Yes. At the New York public library. But, uh, since it's right there on the seven line, I was able to just literally just, you know, walk downstairs, hop the seven, two stops. And I was at the Javits center before I knew it and continued on my, uh, my day from there. And, uh, some of the other panels that I, that I hit, uh, throughout the weekend, uh, they premiered the, uh, the Rick and Morty Dungeons and Dragons module at the, at the con Friday night. 
if I'm remembering correctly, they actually did a full playthrough of a Rick and Morty uh, adventure. And uh, in doing so, Jim Zub was the, uh, was the man behind the mic, and they had Fred Van Lenty as Morty. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, Fred Van Lenty as Morty uh, just, he makes a damn good Morty. <laughs> he's got the voice down well, and he certainly has the personality for it. And uh, they went through an entire adventure with Jim Zub as Rick, and then the rest of the family was filled out by other uh, by other members of uh, of the uh, comics elite. Uh, they don't actually have it listed on the uh, uh, New York Comic Con app, unfortunately. So I'll have to look up exactly who everybody else was. Uh, but either way, it was it was a lot of fun. Had a great time there. Uh, went to a Orville panel on Sunday. Uh, that went into uh, you know what what to expect in the third season, uh, and you know hit a, hit a couple other panels here and there. Actually went to a uh, Samantha B panel. Uh, they had one on uh, the the app they're launching for election twenty twenty, um, and uh, basically just went into uh, you know how that's going to assist people with choosing uh, you know a Democratic candidate for those who who want to choose one, and uh, also just you know discussing you know the state of it and everything and. Samantha B is always hilarious, so it's oh fantastic! Yeah, great to have her involved, uh, and a uh, couple other panels here or there. Nothing really big to really point out, uh, but uh, I did go to at least one uh, LGBTQ panel, uh, which was uh, LGBTQ in comics. Uh, you know, just overall, um, the artist alley needs some work, uh, just because it's stuck where it is and will be for the next five years until they actually continue the extension of the Javits. Um, Mm -hmm. So it used to be in this huge, amazing hall called Javits North, but they tore that down for a more permanent uh, location. Um, And in doing so, the artist alley is stuck in the basement uh, around where uh, the original New York Comic Con took place back in 2006. And it's got enough room, but at the same time, I know for a fact that there are artists that are not getting spaces because there's just not as, as much room as they once had. So this is the space for the first where they had to kick everybody out because of fire code safety. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. The main difference being is that that was the entire con in 2006. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and now it's and, it kind of come full circle there. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, did get to say hello to Gail Simone for a bit. Uh, she was uh, set up with her uh, with her amazing husband, Scott, and uh, we reminisced on uh, on times gone by and reminded them of uh, of when they met us in the first place. Uh, uh, me and, uh, and a friend of mine actually got to. Uh, hang out with them at Second City in Chicago once uh, at at uh, at a C two E two, and that is continues to be a jewel of my comic book experiences. And they're just the friendliest, nicest people in the whole damn world. Like everything you hear about Gail Simone is true. Um, got to say hello to uh, Uncle Sal while he was on the uh, on the floor, and uh, and uh, pay my respects to the man himself. <laughs> and uh, he's he's itching to come back on, fellas. So uh, so we're gonna have mm-hmm. to we're gonna have to make that happen and uh, get the explicit tag out and ready to roll. <laughs> 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 and did not get a chance to see many other uh, you know CGS followers or what have you. Did run into Daryl Taylor on Sunday. Um, so always nice to see him. Uh, the No Apologies podcast, and of course a uh, a, a longtime friend of the show and uh, a listener as well. So good to see him. Uh, Dave Gallagher of, uh, of The Only Living oh, sure. Boy. Um, both him and Sam Ellis were set up on the floor. Uh, so I got a chance to talk, talk to them for a bit. Uh, we used to live in the same neighborhood. So it was, uh, you know, a sort of old old homecoming. Uh, same with Buzz, actually. Buzz's uh, family lives in my old neighborhood. So whenever I, re- I see him, I remind him of that. And, uh, and yeah, that was, that was about it. Uh, overall, um, one of the fastest New York Comic Cons I've ever been to. Like, I feel like everything was running at 2x speed. Um, and I, I think I'm going to have to slow it down a little bit more and maybe do a few more panels and try to pace myself a little more to get right. more room in on the, on the on the Artist Alley Forum, what have you. But uh, it's it's still one of my favorite times of the year, you know? It's crowded as hell, but it's still a manageable crowd as hell. And that's what How was the presence of actual comic book retailers? There's a decent amount. Um, actually, funny enough, uh, the place that I used to buy my comic books when I was in college, uh, 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 Bulletproof Comics, uh, still shows up every year and sets up a booth. And uh, they now actually also have a, uh, a, a art gallery as part of their space. 
And, oh, wow. And they had, uh, they had a whole bunch of art that either they had commissioned or that they had, uh, had received, uh, you know, like professional prints of that they were selling at their booth along with comics. Um, and they would, uh, you know, they, they were in these gorgeous frames and what have you. And, uh, and Hank uh, recognizes me every time, even though I haven't been in college since, you know, 2000, since, you know 2006. Uh, he still remembers me from my time at the anime club. So that's, uh, that's always, always nice to see a friendly face. Did it look like a lot of people were shopping for comics at the con? Uh, yeah, a uh, decent amount, um, especially at the bigger booths, obviously. Like, Image uh, always had people, you know, packed to the gills, looking to buy stuff either from there or from, uh, from Skybound. Uh, Boom Studios uh, was set up with the booth as well, um, and, and there were always people coming by looking at that. Uh, for a second, had a, had a, had a pretty decent size uh, booth with some really good sales going on. And, and really, that's how you do it. Um, as long as you have a sale going on, you're going to get people, unless you're Image and you don't have to. And, and, that's, <laughs> and that's pretty much how that was set up. Uh, Marvel was selling stuff at their booth, but you needed a ticket in order to actually buy it. That's how many people uh, have been doing it over the years, because when I first started buying from their booth, that was not the case, and now it is. Um, so did not buy anything from them, but they certainly had a, a crowd because they're they're still of the big two of DC and Marvel. They're the ones that have an actual like booth presence at New York Comic Con. Still, uh, DC has a uh, uh, a a gallery of costumes they always set up at the very south end of uh, of the Javits Center. And this year they had uh, mm-hmm. Birds of Prey costumes on display. I'm glad you had a good time. Yeah, at a at a very nice time, uh, and also bought a bunch of pops that I didn't need because that's how I roll. You <laughs> <laughs> uh, wouldn't be an American if you didn't buy things you didn't need. Hey, look, if you had told me that there would be a pop of of uh, artist John Michael Basquet, oh I, wow, I would not have believed you, but I own it. <laughs> The only pop I own is Shane Bless His Heart some years back gave me a Ming the Merciless from the film pop, oh, which is wow. proudly here in my shelf in my office. So, <laughs> And Mer- Merd, you'd appreciate that I also purchased uh, for uh, for Chris a uh, pop of the Cabbage Man from Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, okay, I'll, I'll appreciate that if you want me to, Ian. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> oh, I, I forget whether or not you've actually watched it. Have you not watched Avatar? Okay, because... I really never have. Okay, well, to, to explain the joke ever so slightly, uh, whenever there's anything going on uh, involving a chase scene in Avatar, uh, there's this one guy selling his cabbages who almost always will get run over by the group and scream, yeah. Not my cabbages! <laughs> I do enjoy a good running gag, especially one involving produce. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> one other thing I do know about Avatar is that it involves an enormous uh, flying six-legged beaver-bison hybrid thing. Yep. That's Appa. That's Appa. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so, you know, overall, uh, you know, it, it's it's one of those cons where I can understand why some people have, have abandoned it just because of how huge it is, but uh, there's always going to be something, and uh, and hell, I got to take a picture with the uh, with uh, Jesse Pinkman's El Camino, and, and really, where else do you get to do that? Oh, from the, you mean from the Breaking Bad character? Yes, indeed. <laughs> I, sh- I show I still haven't finished. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I have not started. <laughs> Well, now the Netflix uh, movie is out uh, that's supposed to be a continuation, and I, right. I look forward to sitting my ass down and finally getting to watch that. Were Adam and Comfort present at this uh, NYCC, Ian? No, and they haven't been for the last couple of years. Uh, they got waitlisted about three or four years ago, and since then I think they've decided that uh, that they're not going to do it anymore, uh, which is a shame because they always had a good crowd. Uh, it's just uh, I think it's just more dependent on whether or not they're, you know, taking the time and effort uh, to go all the way out there and know for sure that they have a space. Um, and uh, even when they're waitlisted, for all they know, they could find that a week before, oh, hey, you're off the waitlist. And like, great, now we got to get in the car and go all the way from Michigan to New York. So <laughs> that's, that's... And there, there, no podcast set up there, right? Or do some actually still do? Uh, there's still the occasional podcast that sets up with their own booth, uh, but none that I recognized. And okay. uh, for the most part, like, you know, if John Suntress is roaming around, then he's roaming around. Like, he's got, mm. he's got his own setup. So uh, nothing, yeah, not, none of the old stalwarts. Right. It's, there's not been a podcast arena at NYCC for quite a few years now. That is true. Yep. They, uh, they outgrew that, and uh, I, I understand it because, you know, frankly, the benefits they gave us 
uh, you know, even though we were promoting their show, which made sense, like we would get a lot more positive placement and also power as in actual power and not have to pay for it. Unlike what they do for uh, for booths and and artists, so uh, you know that it, it it was it was more of a money thing I think than anything else. Why they no longer did it? Yeah, understandable. We were really getting much the better of the deal than the the con organizers were. Yes, absolutely. But uh, yeah, no, uh, I I had a I had a great time and uh, look we're already looking forward to next year. All right. Yep. Well, Ian, you're you're so passionate that. You almost maybe you want to go back, and who knows? Maybe one year I will, because <laughs> those those panels you describe really, you know, whet my appetite. Oh yeah. So yeah, and and, and I mean, I I, I literally uh, the day that I went to do the the Rick and Morty panel, I literally sat down in three consecutive panels and just didn't move from the room and just enjoyed myself for three panels, and one of which was a Scholastic panel where they gave out so many free books. Uh, I, I got at least like seven graphic novels that were, you know, not for resale, you know, pre-proof versions. But now I've got all this extra stuff to read, so didn't even have to pay a penny for it. Wow. Yep. Good times all around. All right. I wanted to ask you, Ian, because you, before we were recording, you brought up some uh, very interesting Marvel news I wanted you to do introduce so we could discuss oh definitely uh so uh yesterday uh, as we're recording this uh it was announced that uh the man with all the power has even more power kevin feige is taking over as chief creative officer of marvel comics he is going to oversee all creative and story initiatives and that it also includes tv um uh, so that's uh comics tv movies it's Feige's baby now. Even though Ike Perlmutter is still involved, he's very much off in a corner. Uh, the, uh, at the, the the Japanese call it the corner office, and I think that's essentially what what he is now. You know, uh, still getting money, but not really having any power. And uh, now Feige takes over the the comics realm as well. So very interesting news. How do we feel about that, gentlemen? Uh, slightly uneasy. Um, you know, I'm not. Uh, you know, panicking or uh, rioting or anything like that. I'm, I'm not <laughs> not grabbing the pitchfork and the torch, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll be watching what transpires in the Marvel Comics universe a little more carefully henceforth, just to make sure that it doesn't start uh, slowly and sinisterly, you know, in scroll fashion, morphing uh, into the visage of what we've seen in the movies. Uh, and I'm, I, but I am happy as far as uh, the television end of things goes. Uh, you know, there, there's not going to be this uh, the disconnect between you know, the, the television canon and the film canon anymore because now it's all uh, it's all top down under Feige, and so we won't have to worry about him you know, pouting because he doesn't care for Agents of Shield or any of the next Netflix stuff. I think maybe we'll have a little more. Uh, continuity between uh, projects and different media now and uh, which is a good thing as far as i'm concerned between movies and tv but please leave the comics out of it as much as possible mr feige yeah uh, eric merritt i have a similar sentiment again i'm just talking in my rectum here because what do i really know about what goes on but i'm um, just as a fan um i you know i absolutely adore the netflix shows i i even was getting on board with iron fist in the second season uh more and I was so disappointed when these shows just seemed to be kind of ended and, and shushed to the side when all of them, especially Daredevil, I think had a lot more to say, um, and Luke Cage as well. So I don't know if those shows are going to be brought back, um, but I would love it if they did. But regardless, I concur with Murd that you know if they can make everything – because you know, we, we, we're fans. We love continuity. If they can make all that – everything more inclusive, I think that would be wonderful. Um, but I had the same reaction otherwise in that in – that if the comics start to, as Murdy the term, morph more and more into the sensibilities of the cinematic universe, while I love the cinematic universe, I love it as a cinematic universe. And I, I, I appreciate that Marvel, even even though I don't follow the comics as close as I once did, I, st- I still read some of them and I have a general sense of what's going on. But I still really revel in and love and cherish that history, uh, which is why I was so enjoying um, the Mark Wade uh, God of the Marvel Universe book he's scripting right now. Which I've raved about. You know, I hope they they don't kind of sort of gradually kind of cast that to the winds or or, or phase that out completely. Because I think that because you know, let's face it, a hell of a lot more people are going to see the movies than read the comics. So the, a lot of the people reading the comics, I would like to think, still are really plugged into that history. Mm-hmm. So I, I hope you know they still 
maintain that reverence to some degree. Yeah. If they don't, my life goes on. But you know, it would. It would <laughs> I, I, I hope they do. I think. I think that part of this may have to do with. Uh, and mind you, I mean, they both have had power for years and years and years now. I mean, when I think of Joe Quesada and I think of Dan DiDio, um, there's a little bit less – there's been a little bit less of a enthusiasm about events that have been coming out of Marvel over the last couple of years. And that's all been technically under Joe Quesada's umbrella. And I think that may be part of this is, is Feige uh, – may attempt to maybe rejuvenate things a little bit and possibly even get some, you know, creators back involved with Marvel that uh, that may have jumped ship over to one of the other, uh, you know, comic companies, as it were, to try and, like, in- inject some youth and vibrancy back into the line. And I could be wrong. It could just be, you know, old hat. And it could just be a new title. But uh, I also wouldn't be surprised if sometime within the next couple of months we see Joe Quesada leave Marvel uh, for another company. Um, maybe something similar to what Berger did and, and her new uh, you know, Berger Books line uh, or, or something along those lines. It's just Quesada's been with the company since the 90s now, you know? Yeah, that's right. It's, mm-hmm. it's a long run for anybody. And yeah. this just seems like the best out that he could possibly have to try and some, try something new for himself. You know, Bendis did it when he went over to DC, and now who knows what we'll see here with Casada. But then again, Bob Harris is still editor in chief over at DC, so who the hell knows? <laughs> well, one thing I—I I, I mean, to extrapolate, one thing I, I hope to see, based on your, what you're uh, positing about Ian, mm-hmm. is more innovation. When I think about the titles that have most excited me for Marvel in the past few years, like right now, I'm looking at my bookshelf, the Silver Surfer Omnibus of the Slot Allred Run. Yeah. If you can bring creators in and who of that caliber and give them, you know, free reign to really innovate, or like Tom King with the Vision, for example, I mean, those are the books that, for me as a reader, really excite me, and, and I, I sit down and read right away, usually when the, when they, when they premiere. So, please, by all means, let let's let's see more of that because when I go through previews and I, and I, we'll, you know when we do our next previews, a lot of the stuff I just kind of, I'm sure listeners a sense of what we're talking about. It's kind of Oh, this is why I just kind of keep going through it because a lot of it's the kind of the same old stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you saw the concepts or, or, or plot lines. You've kind of seen this stuff before, um, and sometimes that's very comforting. But at the same time, you know, I can only read about this, this certain hero in the same basic situation so many times. Right. So, um, it, it, just for me, even if it's just a couple titles that are just so pushing the envelope in ways that. You know, are are refreshing and new, or maybe they're just kind of doing something in a, in a retro way that's just exciting and, and rejuvenating. That's what I really want to see. So, oh, I, yeah. I, I, if if they go in that direction, I'd I'd be thrilled. Yeah, more more titles like Immortal Hulk and and uh, you know Wade's Doctor Strange and things like that. Uh, oh, but, Apps Mortal Hulk is oh, God. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we those push the envelope in a positive way. And Marvel doesn't always manage to do that. But then again, you know, no comic company is perfect. No, and that's the thing. Like I was saying, n- no one can expect that from any creative entity every time. It's Absolutely. just human, human beings. Like you were saying about Casada, whatever his reasons, the guy's been there since like the Marvel Knights era. Yeah. I mean, any job, I mean, whatever it is you're doing, I mean, you get to a point where like, all right, I got to do something else, or I got to <laughs> shake things up, or whatever, whatever the, it might be, the circumstances. So, yeah, um, yeah it, not everything's going to be, you know, a barn burner. But if we can get a little bit more of that, because anything that ex- is, makes the medium exciting, that can even if it draws just a couple more readers or makes people more aware of, of the concepts, even if they're looking at it in other forms of media, that's what I would like to see, especially as, as you know, comic numbers in the readership, you know, it just continues to dwindle. So, yeah, um, let's 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 get some more innovation like Immortal Hulk, which I'm reading. I'm behind because I read it online, but that, that's the most one of the most exciting Marvel comics I've read in years, uh, you know, and, and it's not it's so deeply rooted in the history of the Hulk. <laughs> but it's, it's just approaching it in just you know a way we haven't seen in so long, and, and in some ways not at all. Especially because it kind of goes all the way back to the Hulk's beginnings as sort of a bridge from like the, you know sort of the Atlas monster characters. Oh sure, yeah. so magnificent. Well, if if this leads to uh, perhaps even tighter integration with digital as well, 
Um, I think that that would be a positive for the medium, especially if, say, for example, you purchase a ticket for a movie, a Marvel movie on Fandango. And they've done this to a certain extent where they'll give you like sample issues of like some of the like, you know, most popular uh, issues for whatever that comic character may happen to be. But say you buy yourself a $17 movie ticket which is the going rate here in New York, and I cringe every single time, and it's why I mostly go on (laughs) Tuesdays when I can get it for cheap. If you bought a a ticket on Fandango and then received a full tray paperback digitally that you could redeem at Comixology for one of the most famous or most popular, uh, you know, runs for that specific character. Like, you know, you go to see... A a perfect example. Like, if you you went to see a a Spider-Man movie... And you got a tray, a, a digital tray for Craven's Last Hunt or something like that. You know that I that would be a way to perhaps drive more more people in to the medium that would otherwise shrug at it. But you know they may have also crunched the numbers on that and said that well it's not viable and that you know if we just go ahead and give these digital codes out nobody's going to use them anyway. So uh, I could be talking out my butt here, but it's <laughs> it's it's it. Like, like Chris was saying, any way you can increase the numbers of people out there is a positive. And even if that was coming out of your butt, it was a magnificent flight. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I think it's a wonderful idea. Yeah. Well, here, here. Do it. Do let, it guys. Let, let me hand you some Cottonelle and you get to work because that's <laughs> that's fantastic. We should all flatulate so thoughtfully. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to get so pathetically locker room there anyway. Continue. Uh, it smells in here. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Moving over to DC, I read I read the two issues of DC's uh, Legion of Superheroes Millennium, so I can discuss that a little bit. Go for it. Wasn't it all what I was expecting? It's m- literally Millennium in name as as much as it is uh, anything else. Uh, you know, very little to do with you know any Millennium title that would have came out of DC before. But the the main driving factor of the comic is the character who is both Rose and Thorn. And for that matter, anybody who hasn't actually read Gail Simone's run on Rose of Thorn from a couple of years ago, please go ahead and do so. Best take on the character in years. Absolutely loved it. Um, but the, something happened to the character uh, uh, as Thorn, where she becomes immortal uh, along the lines of Vandal Savage. Like, she does not age. Because of this, she after a while becomes the only living individual with a split personality because you know further on in the in the life cycle of humanity they develop a way to you know stop this from happening at uh, at birth so there's not even a reason to have any sort of medicine for it anymore so you know she's sitting there talking to uh, the, the the president uh, and and being like listen my only hope is is to get this drug or else I'm going to be Rose and Thorn for the rest of my days, and I don't know how long that's going to be. And her days turn out to be way longer than even she thinks. And we get to see her go through the many different iterations of the DC Universe, including Commandy, including, you know, the, the creation of the, of the Legion of Superheroes, and, and, and further. Um, and it's... It's a good way to sort of bridge the gap and, and show what the future of the DC Universe is, at least in in theory. And she even, in some ways, becomes responsible for Booster Gold. Um, and I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not I'm not going to say how. It's just it, it was a nice scene to throw in. I, I love when they throw command into anything. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but Bendis did a surprisingly cromulent job of this, uh, and <laughs> and, it, and it and it makes it makes me. Uh, really hope that the first issue of Legion of Superheroes connects with me because this was very much connecting. A, a positive end, it's not a negative, definitely. All right. Yep. Yeah, Peter and I uh, were uh, talking about uh, Millennium uh, during, uh, well, off mic uh, during our last uh, Crisis Tapes recording session. It kind of had us scratching our heads, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I have both issues. I've I've skimmed through both of them, so I've, I've I, I know the beats that Ian is talking about here. I, it it, it is uh, kind of a long uh, walk through time yeah. uh, for the immortal, uh, you know, the mysteriously immortal Rose Forest. And as Ian said, we do get to see uh, it's kind of a breezy little uh, Bendis like, uh, somewhat irreverent take on a variety of DC's uh, classic alternate futures. You know, as as, he, as Ian said, uh, you got command 
Dandy. You got uh, the Legion, which is kind of the finish line for the whole thing. Uh, you've got Booster Gold. You've got um, Tommy Tomorrow's Planeteers. You've got uh, uh, the Space Museum. Um, what, what, what kind of uh, had uh, Peter and uh, and me puzzled though was just the choice of our POV character here. Um, you know, you wouldn't really think of you know Rose and the Thorn as uh, the the first uh, character slash characters uh, to be your uh, vicarious tour guide through DC's various futures. Mm. And the only thing we could come up, come up with was uh, this was just uh, Bendis being self indulgent. Uh, he came over to DC wanting to write this particular character because she's a strong female character with a street level pov and uh, bendis just kind of said to himself i want to do this dc wants me to do that i'm just going to smith the two together and that's what the readers are going to get so yeah i think peter and i agreed that uh, we might have enjoyed this a little more if uh, you know somebody else had been uh, our, our guide through time but beyond that uh, I, I kind of enjoyed the way bendis chose to tell the story you know just um, kind of jumping somewhat jarringly from time period to time period. Now, there will be one little vignette with Rose interacting with uh, the uh, peculiar personalities of one DC future time period and then and then appears at the top of the next page. And suddenly we've jumped in time to another possible future and you know, just uh, the, the, the trek continues. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of a little strange. Uh, it's probably better for fans of Bendis, I would say, than for fans of uh, DC's you know, classic future timelines. And it's uh, really you, you don't get to see that much of the Legion uh, until it, it's only like the last couple of pages uh, when, when we finally get uh, a glimpse of Bendis's uh, take on the Legion. So we will see, Ian, if um, the, the, the end of this miniseries is the, the kind of lead in and intro uh, or appetizer, if you will, to uh, the to Bendis's Legion series that you're hoping it's going to be. I agree that there was way less Legion than I was expecting for for a title of the, of this type, but overall, I I, I think I think that it 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 wetted my whistle enough for what's about to come, mm-hmm. um, and I I just more hope that Jonathan Kent you know gets integrated well and that the team dynamic works as a positive for the series itself, and uh, you know he's. It, Bendis has had his uh, his ups and downs with team books over the years, but uh, he did make the Avengers into something pretty damn awesome for a while, um, mm. and and I'm hoping he gets to do the same here with uh, with the uh, Legion characters. Uh, you know, Ian, I'm very soon going to be finding out just what you mean by uh, the damn awesomeness of uh, Bendis's new Avengers, because I'm just now about halfway through Avengers Disassembled. <laughs> oh, so <hurt>. it's it's. <laughs> Fantastic Bendis site adventures await. I concur with Ian. I really enjoyed his run on on Avengers. I mean, not as much as I love the Busek Perez stuff from earlier in that that era, but it's it's a lot of fun. Speaking of DC and things that might some might consider puzzling, shall we discuss a certain film, gentlemen? Why, sure. <laughs> well, we all saw Joker. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were all looking forward to hearing what each of us thought of the film. And uh, Ian, why don't we start with your initial thoughts? All right. Well, uh, for for a a very, very in-depth take on the Joker, uh, anybody who has not listened to my Comic Timing episode 199, uh, pretty much the entire episode is devoted to it. And there are many different opinions about the movie to be shared uh, on on the positive and the negative. Uh, My my overall take on the movie is uh, it is a... A beautifully shot and uh, extraordinarily well acted movie on on the part of Joaquin Phoenix that has no reason to exist. <laughs> <laughs> and I was I was very much hoping that I would leave this movie not thinking that because I I was looking forward to it. I really was. Uh, you know, ever since I saw the first trailer for this movie, it engrossed me and engaged me. Um, I, I thought that. It, uh, you know, setting it in the time period that it did in like the, you know, in like the late 70s, early 80s, uh, gave it a very unique uh, perspective, uh, very much embracing the vibe of, uh, you know, dirty, uh, grimy New York City of the time and adapting that to, to, to Gotham is, is, a, is a cool way to go. Um, however, in the end, I just really thought that the movie would have done better without the name Joker and without even the character Joker, it's just, it's such a, it's such a departure 
um, that it doesn't actually thrive from its connection to the Batman mythos because, you know, you give me something new and, and unique and, and, it, and it actually, like, works in it. I'm like, okay, great, because I love Elseworlds and stuff like that, and that's essentially what this is. But I also learned by the end that I kind of like not knowing how the Joker exists, you know? I kind of like the, 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 the questioning, the, is that really how it happened? And while this movie does present some moments of that, uh, it's a little too concrete. And also, I, it kind of made me think it was trying to make me feel bad for the Joker. And that's something I never really want to do. So overall, very glad with the way that the movie looked and felt, you know, like it was, it was clearly a well-directed movie with some editing choices that could have been a bit better, but still not quite sure why it had to exist. Um, or do you mind if I go? Uh, if you like, Chris, go ahead. Because uh, I, I just basically because of Ian, I basically echo your sentiments. Um, mm-hmm. Just to piggyback, I mean, I'm a I'm a big fan of Joaquin Phoenix. I think he's one of the finest film actors of our day. Oh yeah. And hell, I liked him when he was Lee Phoenix as a kid in Parenthood back in the '80s. You know, going forward, so <laughs> I was really pleased they had cast him in the role. Um, I, you know, I like how they obviously made a tribute to the Scorsese classic King of Comedy right down to Robert De Niro in the role of the, the talk show host. Um, but I, I, I had the exact same reaction, and I was thinking, okay, this is a, a gripping character study of you know a, a deeply disturbed person and, and what happens to them in, in, in a system that you know is inadequate and doesn't care and you know how where, where, where he goes with that. Um, but all, all that aside, not that I was irritated cause it's only a movie, but I, I kept asking myself and I went with our old friend Ryan with the same reaction. Like, why is, why is there even a DC, why are they trying to shoehorn DC into this? Mm-hmm. Because it, like I found that the, the, the portrayal of Thomas Wayne jarring and disturbing cause he was a complete dick. Yeah. And, and like that, that just seemed like, well, let's, we're going to try to make this as different as we can. So we're going to just kind of play with the iconic characters and it just none of that worked for me and it took me out of the film uh to some degree even though i was just mesmerized by his performance and i must say at the end when he has the makeup on he's doing that creepy dance down that exorcist like stairwell that really captivated me and i couldn't take my eyes off his performance but it just felt like they shoehorned in sort of sort of some of the fringes of the batman universe I didn't even think it was necessary. Again, and I, I, I felt the same way, Ian. Right after I saw this movie, I watched, sat down and watched Dark Knight. I hadn't watched it. I mean, I've seen mm-hmm. it a million times, but I hadn't watched it in a while. Yeah. And I'm watching like, well, this is the Joker. <laughs> I mean, like Heath Ledger's portrayal is iconic. And why it's so good is because you have no clue who he is, where he comes from, why he's doing what he's doing. He keeps changing his story. And that's the essence of of sort of the nihilism and just the, the sheer chaos of that character. And that, for me, that's that's really a more terrifying portrayal. This portrayal was obviously terrifying in, in a different way because there are people like that. Sure. <laughs> you know, walking around yeah. who, who, are, who are struggling and also acting out of ways that are deeply destructive to other people. Mm-hmm. I, you know, and I know that was a controversy some, some critics and fans were reacting to with, in that sense. So overall, magnificent performance. He's, I'm sure he'll get nominated for an Oscar. But was it a Joker movie for me in a satisfying way? No. <laughs> Murd? <laughs> interesting segue there from uh, Chris's thoughts to mine because uh, satisfying was exactly the first word I was going to use to describe it. Um, yeah, I've, I've and, and I do use that as, uh, as a, sort of a mild and mitigating uh, term. It was just satisfying as opposed to outstanding. Um, I, I thought it was just, uh, just, 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 just plain good enough as a Joker movie. Um, I agree with uh, what Ian said about uh, its, uh, you know, you know the, the cinematic graphic achievements there. Stylistically, I had no complaints about it whatsoever. Or, well, well, maybe not no complaints whatsoever. It, it did get uh, a little bit uh, heavy-handed and or pretentious at points, and uh, it did uh, employ a few fairly tired cliches in the course of of, of the of, of the unraveling of its story. Uh, the, the, the scene that tried my patience the most, I think, was the one where uh, after 
uh, committing the crime that uh, sort of precipitated all the other events in the plot uh, following uh, when the Joker runs up out – well, okay, when uh, Arthur runs up out of the subway and uh, does that little interpretive dance in front of a bathroom mirror, uh, I was a little <clears> – <throat> A little irritated by that, um, but um, oh, in, uh, by the by, uh, interesting little uh, Easter egg uh, at, during that scene when he's running out of the subway. You can, I, th- I think, read the words "Jerry Robinson Park" on uh, uh-huh. a column there at the subway station. It's one of relatively few uh, Easter eggs for uh, Batman fans to, to, to find in this movie. Really, nice. um, yeah, I uh, I appreciated. Uh, the the period vibe of the whole thing, the way it just kind of wore the, uh, you know, Ian mentioned the you know the gritty, grimy, urban lightedness of New York City at this time, uh, the, the way it, it wore its influences, uh, kind of like a, a fool's crown, caked it on like clown makeup. Um, <laughs> it's, it was very obviously influenced by a certain. A subgenre of uh, 70s period filmmaking. You know, lots of comparisons to Corsese have been here. I would also add like the names of like Sam Peckinpah and uh, the, the the Dirty Harry movies, and uh, even I think I saw uh, like a couple flashes of things that uh, reminded me of Woody Allen at his most morbid. Here in- <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's it's funny you mentioned Woody Allen because I just watched Annie <laughs> Hall the other day, the other day. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. So right. that, that is one of uh, Woody's moodier ones. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. Still hard to believe that it beat out Star Wars for Best Picture. <laughs> but yeah, in any event, I, I appreciated that because I'm just a fan of the '70s and uh, the the various cultural products of that decade, as Todd Phillips and company obviously were too. Um, I, 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 Joaquin Phoenix was fantastic as the Joker. I mean, above and beyond his. Uh, his portrayal of, of this character whose uh, shoddy reality is kind of falling apart, uh, revealing you know, the, the, the highly comedic backdrop behind it. Uh, he he just looked the part yeah. to, to, to an uncanny degree. He, he looked like Marshall Rogers doodled him into existence. <laughs> and, you know, so much so that I, I'm, I'm kind of aching now to see him in proper Joker makeup and hair color. I mean, just to, as opposed to just uh, the, the, the crudely self-applied hair tint and clown makeup that we saw him in in this film. Um, I mean, we didn't actually get to see that in, in this go-round, and I'd kind of like to see him in a more conventional Batman movie in this role at some point in the future. Um as far as uh, whether this uh, movie needed to exist or whether it was an adequate treatment of the Joker, and uh, I was kind of okay with uh, the liberties it took uh, in that regard as well. I mean, it's, it's, the connections to the Bat mythos did feel a little bit forced here and there, um, and uh, we're, we're left you know, a couple of sacred cows tipped. Um, the Joker's connection to Batman, both as an individual and uh, both his and his origin. They are probably going to have a, a few bat purists uh, foaming at the mouth, but uh, you know, <clears throat> if these shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended. You know, this is in <laughs> in no way official or canonical or authoritative. Oh, yeah. It's just think of this as just another one of those alphabetically bulleted options in uh, the Joker's multiple choice past. <laughs> you know, this is just one of the various. Uh, semi hallucinations uh, his fevered mind experiences as far as how what his past was. Sometimes he remembers it one way, sometimes he remembers it another, sometimes he remembers it Todd Phillips's way. So, yeah, don't, I'm, I'm really not all that worried. Um, and even those people who aren't going to be satisfied with that explanation for this movie, just, just to put their minds at ease and help them suspend their disbelief, uh, the, the film does leave it adequately am- ambiguous, I think. Yeah, just uh, the, the Joker's you know, the background, his parentage, um, I mean, I'm not sure how uh, deep into spoilers we're getting here, but uh, spoil away, Murd. Yeah, it's it, it dangles the tantalizing possibility that the Joker might actually be Bruce Wayne's older brother, like yeah. he's the bastard son of Thomas Wayne, which would explain why uh, why such an old actor was cast to play Thomas Wayne. He looked physically older uh, than I usually picture Batman's father being, and uh, it wasn't too long into the film's runtime that it became apparent why they had to make that creative choice to make uh, Joaquin Phoenix as old as he is uh, credibly uh, the, you know the offspring of this man um but you know there, there there's enough uh, ambiguity left in there that uh, you know maybe he's not actually Thomas Wayne's bastard son but maybe he is maybe he's just some foundling who was adopted by the woman he's believed to his, be his mother all this time you know and that 
which which kind of adds to uh, you know the continuing degradation of everything that uh, the man who believed himself to be Arthur Fleck has been clinging to as, as the hard and fast truths of his reality, when in fact you know that uh, multicolored piebald Harlequinesque bright tacky wallpaper behind uh, what he thought his life had been uh, is, is starting to show through the cracks and uh, you know, it's yeah the, the fact that he's not the man that he's uh, always thought he's been uh, con- it, I, I just thought it worked well yeah. just to, it con- contributes to the slow disintegration of his connection to this uh, society and this social system um, that uh, has, uh, is slowly failing him and that uh, he has known all along in some subconscious part of his warped mind to be just one massive joke. And he realizes that he himself has been little more than a comedic prop in a joke that uh, his adoptive mother, possibly adoptive mother, has been playing on herself all these years. And so, yeah, gradually he's <laughs> – I, I liked uh, the detail of his uh, his condition, uh, the, the, how Arthur was just constantly cackling at inappropriate moments. And uh, how we finally uh, realize, as he slowly realizes, that uh, it, it's not just him cackling reflexively. Uh, at some level of his consciousness, he's aware of uh, just the the pointlessness yeah. and uh, the sad hilarity of uh, these constructs that humankind has put together for themselves. And uh, the part of his mind that will eventually rise to the surface as the Joker has been laughing at them mm-hmm. involuntarily all these years. And yeah. Uh, yeah, d- 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 I like the way his origin story is constructed here. I mean, if again, it's not uh, intended to be a definitive origin story for the character. In some not. points, yeah. it's a little bit predictable and by the numbers. But I think it's an adequate origin story for the Joker, as long as we understand it's just one of many possibilities. And uh, I, I just like the way that the story was told. And I think we can all agree on that much, at least. Oh, I, I again – his performance, I couldn't take my eyes off it. That's oh, brilliant. Yeah. Um, I, I just – and, Murad, I'm glad you went last because no one does criticism on the show better than you. But <laughs> I, I, I just – well, that's the way I see it, brother. But I, I just – the movie, there was just certain aspects of it that just left me feeling, for lack of a better term, just dissatisfied. I think it's a good movie. I just didn't walk out of the theater thinking I'd really seen a movie necessarily about – I guess my when I think about the Joker, uh, uh, there were el- there were elements. I'm sorry, and there were elements of it that I mean. Here, for example, when he kills the guy in his apartment, and they have this scene where the little person's trying to get up to the chain on the block, and you know the whole audience burst out laughing because it's horrifying. But that was also a, like a Joker moment in that movie where <laughs> that really resonated with me as like, okay, that's this is horrifying, but it's also really darkly funny mm-hmm. and. Phoenix is acting there after he brutally murders the the, the other guy, and then he's just kind of like trying to freak out the, per, the little guys. He's trying to grab the lock, and that that scene really resonated with me as okay, this that, that's that's very much a Joker moment because it's horrifying, but you can't take your eyes off it. <laughs> I think I think that one of my major problems and and mistakes that I made was. Mind you, I've still never seen Taxi Driver. I'm going to correct that soon. Uh, oh, that's I, a great I've, movie. I've, I've never seen it, but I've seen the other movies that these this movie was clearly influenced by recent enough to feel that they are superior works than that Joker. Uh, you know, King of Comedy. Oh, and, King of Comedy is tremendous. Oh. And, and to a point, <laughs> Network. Uh, Oh, one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, it's, it's an amazing movie, yeah. and I, and yeah. I saw I got to see Cranston portray. Uh, oh, you lucky SOB! Uh, it was so oh, it was so yeah. good. Yeah, no, nah, it, it like one one of the bet, most amazing Broadway experiences of my life was watching Network on stage, um, and uh, it, 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 Tatiana Maslany was in it as well, and it, it just the staging of it was beautiful. You know, but you're right because Ian, I had the same reaction. There yeah. definitely was that network vibe. Yes, in the movie as well, especially Absolutely with especially with that, with that last scene, uh, because yes, uh, you know, with with the, with all the TV monitors and what have you, like it's it's mm-hmm. it's a little bit of King of Comedy and a little bit of network, but mostly network. And I I feel like for a, for a movie like this that is so much on derivative works, you got to do everything superb. And it did it great. It did. It just didn't do it superb. 
and uh, to be a send up like that, you got you got to do it superb. So that that that's that may be one of my problems is that I just like Whoa. the works it's based yeah. on so much more than the than this actual work. One thing that just struck me, and this is this is just a minutia because I just found it funny, was that at the end they put this therapist in this room, yeah, with this homicidal maniac. <laughs> <laughs> And he just has little handcuffs on. There's no guards, nothing. And then you assume he's murdered her because he runs out and is caking blood on the floor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that really struck me that I thought was well done. Again, he's he, he's a tremendous actor. Um, he's one of those actors who vanishes into the role. And when you think about film actors, there are film actors you really enjoy, but they're always that person, right? Like I like Dwayne Johnson. He's fun, but he's always J- Dwayne Johnson in yeah. movies, right? Yeah. When you see an actor like a Robert Duvall, right, or, or like a Joaquin Phoenix or a Sean Penn or the best example, Daniel Day-Lewis, they vanish into their roles. Mm-hmm. And you saw that in this film, and that was very enjoyable to watch as, as a film fan. But the scenes where he's imagining he's with the woman, the neighbor, yeah. and for me the most terrifying moment in that film, when he's in her apartment, and you kind of sense that it was always in his head because it just didn't make sense that you'd suddenly just be pals with him. But when she comes out of that room, it's great acting, and she is absolutely terrified. And you know he killed her and her child. I mean that's how I took it. Did, did you guys have the same reaction? Or I, I, I'm split 50-50 on it. To be okay. Honest. I'm 50-50. It never occurred to me for a moment. Yeah. Really? And- I figured uh, I, I, the, the twist I did see coming was that uh, his relationship with her was entirely in his imagination. Yeah. Um, when when he, she first came to his apartment and said, you were following today, weren't you? And instead of being terrified by that, she seemed to be kind of into it. I thought, yes. OK, this is just this is a delusion of his. But, yeah, I really did not think that he was going to kill her or her daughter. Yeah. OK, because I, I thought he did. It, it, they specifically leave that up to interpretation for, yeah, so that you do. can go either way. Um, my other my other issue, and I brought this up a little bit uh, when I talked about it other elsewhere, but uh, my, one of my other issues with that is that the movie doesn't lean anywhere near far enough into the hallucinations. That we see all those hallucinations, and then all of a sudden they just stop. You know, like mm. like when he when he realizes that 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 that, that you know that uh, Sophie Dumond was never really there, we don't ever really see anything else after that. So you know, that that part of his disorder just disappears, or we're just uninterested in that anymore. And it, it was it was one of the things that left me coldest about about the about the about the, about mm. the piece is that if he's if he's divorced from reality, he should be divorced from reality. Mm. Uh, they didn't drive it home enough for me. Well, in a way, he's. De- at that point, becomes most fully divorced from the version of reality he was clinging to, and, uh, and instead embraces, you know, the underlying to him more truthful reality that uh, life is a sick joke, mm. and he should just go around killing people right. with abandon. And I, I think uh, the stuff like his relationship with Sophie Dumont and his relationship with his mother and his success, quote unquote, as a stand-up comic, were all a part of that reality. Yeah. So once he you know, comes to grips with uh, the uh, morbidly hilarious truth that's been underlying um, you know, the commonly accepted view of reality that uh, he's now moving past, uh, I think that's when the the convention of the uh, or the, the well the device of the of of, of his personal delusions uh, that we experience with him is is abandoned. Question: Just a casting question. The actor played Thomas Wayne. Was he the CAD congressman in in Dark Knight Rises? Uh, who the cat, who Catwoman of Ducks? Yes, yes, he I is. I thought he was. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. He also played. He also played Barton Blaze in Ghost Rider. I, I've kind of wiped that movie from my memory, <laughs> man, but you know. <laughs> Only because IMDb showed me that I even remember that. That's <laughs> that. That's about. That's it. still one of my all time favorite bad movie experiences. I left that theater weeping just because I was so. Elated at how bad it was. I was laughing so hard. Speaking of bad Fantastic. movie experiences, I, I have to bring this up. Uh, I'm sitting there watching the movie. We get we get to the scene, uh, the second subway scene with the uh, with all the people in masks and what have you, and yeah, and, and, yep, he's, yep. and he's getting off. And uh, right as that scene is taking place, a scene I've been looking forward to all damn movie because you know that was some of the uh, leaked footage that had come out beforehand. 
And I knew that it was filmed not too far from me. And I, I even remember them filming at 18th Avenue on the F train uh, on my way into last year's New York Comic Con because they had a, uh, a, a Gotham uh, uh, subway uh, train parked at the station. So, mm. I, so I knew that they were filming that day and I'm on my way in. Uh, as I'm sitting there watching it, these two people come into the theater, go directly in front of me and demand that the two people sitting next to me leave their seats because they have those seats. We're two, oh. hour, we're two hours into the movie, and they're demanding this. They take out their phones, their bright phones, and s- point them into the face of the people. And, of course, the people respond, you're in the wrong theater. <laughs> you see, if our beloved co-founder Brian Deemer was here at this moment, he would start on one of his rants about it. That's why he never goes to the movies anymore. He prefers <laughs> to watch everything at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, so I didn't get Spot to see on. that scene, and I don't know if I'm going to be re- rewatching that movie anytime soon, but uh, yeah, that was a problem. But at least now, AMC gave me th- uh, uh, comp tickets as a response when I explained oh, it to that's them, good. so that was nice. Am I correct in that I heard that they are not doing anything else with this version of the Joker? Um, I thought I heard that. As of now, I- they're not. Yep, I, I don't. I think it was always meant to be self-contained, you know, not touch up any kind of new universe or anything like that. Yeah, you know, unless it makes enough money, and then they suddenly so they want to base the next Batman movie in it. You know, that's, yeah. yeah. Well, it did uh, break an October record set by Venom last year. You know, it made like ninety-two million dollars in its first weekend, uh, just domestic alone. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, overall, it did. It did. It did. Better than they even expected it to, so that's mm. that's uh, you know not 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 too shabby, all things considered. And for something that was made as if it's an art house film, it certainly made a ton uh, tons of money. Mm. Now, Birds of Prey is coming out this coming year. Is that correct? Uh, f- yes, February. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Did you guys get a trailer for Birds of Prey featuring the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn? Yes, no, I, I did not. I did. Well. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, I'll have to watch it online. Yeah, it's a it's a trailer that's very much Harley focused, and they better have another trailer featuring everybody else soon. Uh, but they made point of including the line, you know, the Joker and I broke up, like like in in the in her in her monologue uh, it, it, throughout the uh, the trailer, and uh, I'm like, yeah, no, he, you sure did, because he ain't showing up again. Jared Leto's not 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 going to be the Joker anytime soon. Mm. Uh, is this the same actress playing her? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, I saw a poster uh, in uh, the theater lobby for Birds of Prey, and it pictured a giant image of Harley Quinn's head with uh, all the other characters flying around said head with little Cupid wings attached to their backs. <laughs> so it sounds to me like this is really going to be much more a Harley Quinn movie than a Birds of Prey movie, and that's a shame. Yeah. And that's the same actress who was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, right? Yes. Yeah, she's. I think she's fantastic. Yes, Mar- Margot Robbie. So, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. love that actress. So. Right, now, tell me this, Ian. Mm-hmm. Um, during your showing, yes. uh, uh, up there, uh, did uh, was anyone turned away from the theater for arriving in a mask or, or clown makeup? Uh, no, and mind you, this was during New York Comic Con. Um, but I, mm-hmm. n- not not that I'm aware of, there was increased security. Just you know, just in general, uh, like there were definitely at least a couple of police in the uh, in the lobby that wouldn't have normally been there, uh, but I did not experience anybody being turned away at my particular theater. No, mm. yeah, it's just kind of surreal uh, that that they, 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 they've deemed it necessary to issue a, a national a nationwide prohibition at theaters showing this movie against clown masks. Yeah. Because, you know, it's, it's one of the more interesting wrinkles of the movie, and I think, is in, in the way it's portraying the Joker character is that he's shown as, as, as kind of a Bernard Getz figure. You know, yep, in, yep. In the, the you know the famous subway vigilante. He slays people uh, in the subway, and then uh, all inadvertently touches off kind of this uh, countercultural movement, much more so than the real life Bernard Getz did in uh, the real world New York City. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, he becomes uh, this uh, accidental. Uh, folk hero uh, touching off this massive bloody uh, class revolt in Gotham and uh, it's just kind of interesting that uh, that's all that this movie with uh, that you know, plot element in it is being released at the same time as uh, there's uh, this big widespread revolt and a ban on the wearing of masks in Hong Kong halfway around the world yeah yeah it's 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 in very very fascinating timing clearly with 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 
what happened, you know, during the screening of, uh, of, of, you know, Dark Knight, uh, you know, years ago, um, they, they definitely wanted to take extra precautions, I feel like, um, especially with what, with the way that the world has been going of late, uh, with, uh, you know, shootings continuing to occur as often as they do. Um, every single precaution was taken. I mean, I really didn't expect anything to happen, but I still completely understand why security was the way it was. And uh, look, I'm all for those precautions. Yes. hundred percent. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Speaking as a teacher who, you know, you sit in lunchroom duty and you're thinking, all right, someone in here is probably not wired right. Yeah. Um, you know, any precaution to take, you know, at, you know, we're still have the opportunity to see the film. It's not like the film is being censored or anything like that, which I would also have a problem with. Yep. Absolutely. What, one thing that Murd mentioned I wanted to jump back on for a minute is one of the things that did take me out of the movie, I never bought for a second the whole class uprising at, out of his behavior. Like that that I thought was very ham-handed. Hmm. Um, I, I never never for a moment really bought that. Granted, it's a movie but still, but I just – I, I just never, never b- believe that. Okay, there's going to be like, and they coordinate the ambulance crash, like to get him out of there, and that none of that, none of that worked for me at all. Um, that was just me, but well, that was the one of the parts of the movie that really I just t- took me out of it. R- related to that, the thing that took me out of it was the scene that all movie long I was saying to myself, "Oh, they better not do it. Oh, they better not do it." And then there, they did it. You know, the Waynes getting killed. And, and, you know, Bruce being there in the alley, like the most overplayed scene in movie <laughs> history at this point, they went ahead and did. And I understand why they did it. But at the same time, if you're making a Joker movie, I feel like it just would have worked a lot better without even trying to bother with that. Uh, but they had they had to go ahead and put the uh, the Batman capper on it uh, to, to try mm. and, you know, uh, make people well, feel satisfied. It- and in a way, Ian, there's precedent because go back to the 89 Keaton film. They they mm-hmm. established that the Joker was the, the genesis for the Wayne's death. Right. Literally in that one as well. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Yep. That's a good point, Chris. That occurred to me as well. Kind of uh, indirectly fulfilling uh, what uh, Burton and Sam Hamm uh, first uh, hypothesized back in 1989. Uh, but yeah, I understand your irritation, Ian. That that was something I didn't think the movie needed either. Plus, it commits the uh, sin of the Gotham TV show in that it it dooms Batman to forever be fighting villains who are like thirty years older than he is. Yeah. <laughs> it, it also it also it also dooms us to bring up Zorro the Gay Blade from nineteen eighty one, a movie that absolutely nobody remembers exists. Oh, my, my father remembers it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. He actually quotes it from time to time. <laughs> Well played, well played. <laughs> yeah, you gotta love the Murdo household. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Tremendous. All right, you yeah. guys wanna give it some freckin' swears? Uh yeah, sure. I'll start off. Uh gave Unless it. Murdo, did you have other comments? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, nope. No, let's let's proceed. Go ahead, Ian. Uh I give it uh two and a half out of five. I'm right with you. That's a two and a half for me as well. And that's that's really based especially on his tremendous performance. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to go three and a half, maybe three and three quarters. All right. Honestly, I, I appreciated the setting, the style, all that stuff. I mean, it uh, it omitted some of the. I mean, there's there's no uh, Red Hood, no Ace Chemical Company, all, none of the things we might uh, prefer to see in a Joker origin movie. It's not Killing Joke the movie, no. but I think it tells a, a pretty. It, 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 there's a number of things that are predictable, but there are some pretty interesting and art artful twists to it that I think it, it, it's a film worth seeing. Uh, it's, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little more convinced than you guys are that it, 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 it needed to exist. So fair enough. I give it a slightly higher rating. Well, uh, the two, uh, like three other random things to bring up. I uh, love how much of it was filmed in the Bronx uh, because uh, not a lot of movies uh, feature the Bronx as much as, as, as this one did. And uh, as a new re- resident of the Bronx, it's nice to see, you know, that being brought up. And I even recognized a few places and the steps and what mm-hmm. have you were definitely from the Bronx. Um, the other thing, if you have not watched last week's Saturday Night Live, uh, they, <laughs> they, they had a sketch uh, called The Grouch. Which is the best parody you could have possibly had of this movie? <laughs> David Harbour yeah. was the get was the uh, was the host, and uh, and he puts on the uh, the Oscar makeup, and it was beautiful. 
<laughs> yeah, Ian, I, I saw that on YouTube, and then I saw you linking it on your Facebook feed, and I agree, it, it is a pitch perfect parody <laughs> of, of Joker. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, my, my Did he ba- meet a dark take on Oscar the Grouch? Asks Variety. Yes. No, answers the New York Times. <laughs> uh, you only arresting Elmo because Elmo Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> And one last thing. Oh. Yep. I'm Mayor Harpin. You can't see it, but it's happening. I believe you. <laughs> All is right with the world. Yes, it <laughs> is. Yes, it is. It is time once again for Muddle the Murd here on Comic Geek Speak. And the mud, the man getting muddled will explain to you how you muddle. All right. Well, it's really very simple, folks. Uh, well, all you need to do is email to comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. Three comic trivia questions. One of them must be about Marvel Comics, one about DC, and one about comics from some third publisher. And also they must break down chronologically into one question about comics uh, published prior to 1970 AD, one about comics published between 1970 and 2000 inclusive, and one about comics published after 2000 AD. Um, And then I will endeavor to answer those three questions of your submission, and if I fail to answer any one of them correctly, if I get all three wrong, you will have won a prize. Excellent. And what that prize be? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked, and unfortunately I forgot that we are going to be recording – I forgot that I was going to be uh, uh, recording this downstairs (laughs) since uh, my folks are – uh, conveniently absent, so I'm taking advantage by uh, recording in more com- comfortable surroundings. The prizes are still upstairs. Okay. But I'm pretty sure that what I have uh, from the uh, cash of prizes provided to us by our uh, ever-faithful and ever-generous anonymous donor uh, is going to be a uh, an original art page from uh, the first issue of the Godzilla The Half-Century War miniseries, art by James Stocco. Um, and it uh, comes with a little certificate of authenticity from Cadence Comics Art. Very cool. Very cool. So we'll see if uh, our uh, contestant tonight uh, has an interest in kaiju comics. I, I hope he does. Well, this uh, this contestant hails from Down Under. It's uh, Oh. Yep. Oh, dear. That's <laughs> going to be expensive if I am muddled. <laughs> well, the uh, the person is uh, Martin Bow. And uh, he said, "Oh yes, he's a frequent contestant. Uh, he uh, yeah, he's been listening for a good long time, and uh, uh, he's been competing in our various trivia contests long enough that he submitted uh, several entries to uh, deceive the D, the late great Jamie D uh, TV trivia." Wow. Uh, <laughs> well, Martin is back for another one, and uh, he says, "Hi, geeks. I thought I'd try another go round for muddling Murdo." This time, my questions relate to surnames. Okay, this is actually a specialty of mine, so let's see if if I'm picking up what he's laying down. All right, we begin <laughs> with uh, DC pre-1970. What is the Legion of Superheroes member Sunboy's surname? Uh, Morgna, first name Dirk. You are correct, sir. Oh, not even hesitation. I don't have to make something to Australia. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, if only I had a foster I, drink right I, I, now. There's fair, I, I can't claim to be as big a Legion fan as any of the Legion of Substitute podcasters, but uh, you are our friends and allies in the uh, uh, comics podcasting crusade, but I, I do know the home worlds and the names pretty well, at least. Nice. All right, we move on to 1970 to 2000, Independent. In regards to the detectives Sam and Twitch from the Spawn comics, what is Sam's surname? You know, there was probably a point in the 90s when I could have answered this, but I, I cannot right now. And fortunately, I, I don't have to to avoid a muddle. <laughs> so I'm just going to take a knee on this one. Uh, Chris, any idea? None, my friend. All right. The answer is Burke. Sam Burke is his full name. Yes, I am positive I did know that at one time. Darn it. And here we are with Marvel Post 2000. In regards to Avengers member Striker, what is his surname? Avengers member Striker. Yes. Okay, I, this must be a fairly recently introduced character because I am unaware of the Avengers having a member named Striker. 
Yeah, neither neither do I actually. Yeah, that doesn't ring a bell with me either. I must admit. Huh. Striker. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, you know what? I think Striker might have been from Avengers Academy. Oh, all right, all right. Which means, yeah, I've, I think I've got all the issues of that. So I will know this at one time, but <laughs> at, it's at, at some future point. But at the moment, I'm just going to guess Guthrie because there's so many Guthrie kids running around the DC universe, or the Marvel universe. That'll be a nope. Uh, the answer is sharp yep. with an E. Oh, all right. Yep. But, well, thank you, Sun Boy. Yes. <laughs> and indeed. sadly, uh, Martin, the sun has gone down on this muddle attempt. But thank you oh. for trying once again to muddle. Now, you've been a longtime friend of the show. I hope you keep on participating and keep on trying. Yes, indeed. Yep. Saved by the sun. And we encourage our listeners to keep sending in more questions. Mm. Yes, because we do still have some prizes to give away. Yep. And now, if I may, I'd like to contribute a bit of uh, trivia of my own, just to, to you know, get things somewhat back on track here. Just one more little thing, little Easter eggy, show offy thing about the Joker movie. Uh, the, the the little person that Chris mentioned a little while ago, that that scene where he witnesses the Joker stabbing to death one of their fellow clown service coworkers in his apartment, and then has to ask ask Arthur to let him out of the apartment because he can't reach the lock. Uh, that that little person, the character's name is Gary. A little known fact, uh, the Joker, briefly, back in the swinging go-go 60s, had a sidekick um, whose name, uh, who was also a little person in a kind of a scaramouche, uh, punchinello clown suit, uh, whose name was Gagsworth P. Gagsworthy, or Gaggy for short. So instead of a gaggy, this movie has a Gary. <laughs> I would like to think that there's a connection there. I would like to think so as well. In fact, now my head canon is there is. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, may I segue to a tomorrow's shout out? Oh, sure. By all means. So um, I was reading the past few weeks, uh, Alter Ego 160. The cover title is Steve Ditko Remembered. And let me tell you, I mean, I, I sing the praise of tomorrow's regularly, and, and I never tire of that. But this is one of the best issues of Alter Ego I, I've read yet. I mean, Roy Thomas and his his writers go all out to give you as comprehensive comprehensive a view of you know one of the most mysterious creators in comics. Um, and if you're a fan of Ditko or you just want to learn about Ditko. I cannot repre- uh, recommend, I should say, this issue enough. It's Alter Ego 160. Uh, you know, they have a fantastic, uh, you know, overview of his career. They have an interview he gave in 19 19- because he didn't get that many interviews. An interview he gave in 1968. Various essays on him. Uh, one of the things I found most fascinating: there's an essay by a fan named Bernie Bubness. It's called "A Life Lived on His Own Terms." I think he was involved in, in the early New York Con in the 60s that Ditko went to which is like a legendary con now. And he maintained over the years sort of a loose friendship with Ditko. Like when he was a young, like, like a teenager, he went to a studio many times and, you know, even Ditko would talk to him and, and try to try to give him advice. And then, you know, 50 years later in 2017, he actually reconnects with Ditko and he and his wife go to a studio and what really struck me besides just his recollections of his experience with Ditko his wife actually took a photograph of Steve Ditko in 2017 and it's it's him unlocking the door to his studio wow and and there's a there's a wonderful moment here I'm going to read it so I'm I'm this is Bubnis's words he says the reason he was on the elevator was because his studio did not have a bathroom. He had to go to another floor. Before he would let us in, he looked at his, my wife and said, you can stay out here if you're going to take more pictures. My wife had to bite her tongue and ego. Without saying a word, she pocketed her camera. But she took two pictures of him outside the studio. And I got to say it was so – I don't think jarring is the right word, but it was so striking to see Steve Ditko as an old man, hunched over, bald – but it's still clearly him, that face, because there's so few actual pictures of Steve Ditko. I mean, we've all seen the famous photograph of him sitting at a studio in the 60s with the glasses on. And I think he has like a flannel shirt on as that sign that says think um, near his workstation. And they're, they're, th- that's it. Like I've rarely ever seen any photographs of the man. And to see this picture, it just it was so striking. It's, it's such a human 
moment of you know this legendary enigmatic creator like one of the the founding fathers of the Marvel universe um and and to see this photograph it it, it really struck me and and the oh, this overall issue is is magnificent and I, I can't praise Thomas and the crew enough for what they've done here because they they just go I mean all into people who knew him who went to his studio you know critical analysis you know talking about obviously it's chock full of of artwork and just talking about you know Mr. A and the question and you know you know when you study Ditko and, and his objectivist philosophy and that permeates a lot of this as well um, it's a fantastic issue. And, you know, Steve Ditko for me is, is, is one of my – certainly one of my all-time favorite artists. I, I, I always get the, the nagging sense that I don't know if I would have liked him as a person quite honestly, um, and that's just – I don't know. I, I just a feeling I have, but that doesn't matter. What matters is the artwork and, and, and the contribution he made, and boy, it's here in spades. So Alter Ego 160 is highly recommended. For such, it's, it's a wonderful tribute to one of the most important people who contributed to the American comic book. And I wanted the comic shout out, if I may. Go right uh, ahead. So I just got issue one of Grendel Devil's Odyssey by, for me, one of the living masters of the medium, Matt Wagner, with colors by his son, Brennan Wagner, and letters by Dave Lampierre. If I mispronounce that, I apologize. This book is important to me. A, it's fantastic because my first exposure to Matt Wagner was in the 90s when he was doing the Grendel War Child miniseries. I knew nothing about Matt Wagner, nothing about Grendel except that I knew there was a I knew about the, you know, the ancient literary work, but I don't know anything about this comic character, but the the art struck struck me and I just grabbed it just on a whim and I've never looked back. I've devoured everything Grendel. I went back and read the Komiko stuff, the Hunter Rose stories. I also got into Mage. Um and here Wagner's returning to his Grendel Prime character, who's the cyborg warrior who's living in this dystopian future where the legacy of Grendel has now culminated in this world spanning totalitarian state, essentially. Um, and this is this story goes even a century later because the cyborg, he's still alive, he's still functioning, and he's called upon by the last Grendel Khan to take us a, a spaceship into the you know, in, out into space to find a new planet to repopulate the human race. And he's carrying the DNA of the first Grendel Khan, um, Jupiter Asante. Wow. Uh, not, not Jupiter Asante, that's his son, Arma, I think it's Armand Asante, um, whoever the first Grendel Khan was. And it's Wagner art, which I absolutely adore. It's Wagner sensibility. Um, I've always loved Wagner's vision. His, his storytelling chops are, are without peer. Oh, oh, Orion Asante. I'm sorry. That was the first Grendel Khan. Orion Asante. Um, and he hasn't l l l missed a step here. So if you're a fan of Grendel, th th this is something I highly recommend people pick up because you're going to love it. The first issue, I was immediately taken with it. Um, t like when I think of, you know, great living matches, I think of, you know, Terry Moore and I think of Matt Wagner, someone who's always really held true to his vision, his sensibility as, as a storyteller and a creator and this continues that trend. So, highest recommendation. That's from Dark Horse Comics, Grendel Devil's Odyssey, one of eight. Nice. Uh, I, I want to go through my uh, my New York Comic Con haul real quick, as I just went ahead and grabbed a bunch of the books that <laughs> I uh, that I received while there, um, including the freebies. Uh, all from that Scholastic panel that I mentioned, I got the uncorrected proof of the first of the I Survived graphic novels, uh, based on a series of books by Lauren Tar uh, Tarshis. Um, about people who survived, you know, great disasters that have happened over the years. And uh, the first one is I Survived the Sinking of the Titanic. Oh. And it's uh, Lauren Tarshish with art by House Studio. Uh, and, uh, yeah, full full graphic novel of that, uh, along with a, a volume of the Babysitter's Little Sister uh, graphic novel, Karen's Witch by Ann M. Martin, uh, Donut the Destroyer, which looks like a nice, a nice, cute uh, little comic by uh, Sarah Grayley and Steph uh, Perennis. And uh, Not Enough, a, uh, a, another uh, uh, scholastic book by Maria Scriven. And uh, those were all for free. Got a free uh, Rolled and Told issue. Uh, Rolled and Told is a Dungeons & Dragons anthology, essentially. And uh, that's, that's what uh, 
this issue of uh, World Untold is. It's a free issue. And I, res- I also got uh, Luke Cage Everyman, which is by uh, Anthony uh, Del Cole with art by uh, Janoy Lindsay. I hope I'm oh, I haven't read that. that. Yeah, this was uh, an entirely digital series, which, okay. which they then released uh, at, uh, as, uh, as a trade, collecting the whole thing. And I, I flipped through it when I was at uh, Anthony Del Cole's uh, table. Fortunately, he wasn't there at the time, uh, so I couldn't thank him on it. But uh, it uh, looked really interesting. Uh, it's uh, you know set almost entirely in Harlem, uh, and uh, the rich and powerful are dropping dead from mysterious illnesses, and it's up to Luke Cage to stop the everyman killer, even though he's just received a grim diagnosis of his own. So he's uh, problems on the inside for the man who's un- un- indestructible from the outside. So that's uh, a very, very interesting uh, take on, on Luke Cage that I wanted to check out. But my, the crowns of what I received will make Chris Eberly do his Chris Eberly Ooh. thing. Let me stand up. I'm ready. I finally got volumes one and two of Black Hammer. Oh. <laughs> let, me, let me do a little shimmy here. All right. <laughs> no rhythm. It's painful, but I am just... I'm ecstatic for you. I can't wait to hear your reaction. I look forward to it. Uh, it, it was uh, buy one, get one on the last day of the con at the Dark Horse booth. So I went ahead and headed over there and, uh, and grabbed my the first two volumes of that. And uh, also, while I was at Gail Simone's booth, I picked up issue one of Seven Days. And I'll be discussing that in the next episode for sure, because uh, that have uh, been looking forward to reading it. And to get it from Gail herself just makes it even better. And the uh, six ish- first six issues of Crowded which I uh, nominated for a uh, Best of CGS award this past, uh, this past Best of CGS. Uh, volume 1 is out, and I went ahead and got the physical copy of it. So. All right. Ian, well, next comic talk, we'll, we'll definitely, because uh, by then I should have finished um, the Black Hammer JLA crossover. I haven't started reading that yet. So nice. we can talk about that. Guys, I'm sorry i got to run. I have a family issue that just popped up. I apologize. Not a problem. But I figure we we're close to shooting our bolt anyway. Yep. Again, love to you both, and uh, we will talk soon gentlemen yep sounds good to me all sir. right good night guys Carry on, brother. merge you got anything else uh sure well i had a couple of uh, off the rack type things to talk about here but uh, one of them i wanted chris to hear so i'll just uh i'll do the other one okay go right ahead uh and uh uh yeah it's something that i've been waiting to read and uh you know give uh, some kind of mention to on the podcast for years now um, it's a Boom publication, so it's something probably some of those folks that you saw at the Boom booth at New York Comic Con were probably picking up. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just uh, re- it's been released in hardcover for years, but they finally got around to bringing it out in softcover. Uh, it is a collection of the first volume of Grant Morrison's Klaus. Ah, yes. I'm glad you finally That's picked right. it up. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, well, I, I I wanted to see uh, Morrison's take on a. <laughs> A uh, very offbeat uh, and uh, genre fusion uh, Santa Claus origin story, and uh, so that's what uh, this trade paperback delivers. Uh, it's a collection of a seven-issue miniseries written by Morrison with uh, uh, some very nice artwork by Dan Mora. Um, it's uh, apparently uh, Mora was nominated uh, for uh, an Eisner Award back in 2017 for Best Penciler Inker. Uh, which I must assume he did not win, or uh, the little medal stamped on uh, the front cover here would probably say Will Eisner winner, as opposed to just nominee. Um, But uh, in addition to that little stamp, the front cover shows um, a bearded uh, medieval woodsman uh, stalking through the snow with a bloody stag slung over his shoulder and a bloody snouted wolf stalking in his wake. Uh, And this is the guy who supposedly is going to become Santa Claus, uh, as, uh, as Morrison would have it. Um, yeah, I really was not sure whether I would uh, uh, care for this at all. Um, when, uh, I've had my misgivings about it ever since I first uh, read the preview solicitation mm-hmm. all the way back in 2015 when this was first published. Uh, but having bought it and uh, used it as bedtime reading uh, for um, a little while um, – here in, in the autumn, and and I, I did go out of my way to read it early. You know, read it now before I, I we, we get to Christmas time, and I'm in the mood for more traditionally Christmassy fare. And I think that was probably a good idea, <laughs> as I, I think this actually makes a better October reading than it would have made December reading. Hmm. Um, it, it, it for me as a Christmas purist, it, it really works best if I just tell myself this is not 
it's kind of the same uh, brain disconnection process that I need to perform to enjoy Joker as much as I did. I just have to apply that to Santa Claus. This is not the origin of Santa Claus. It, you needn't even think of it as an origin of Santa Claus, although that's really what Morrison intends it to be. Just think of it as an interesting sort of barbarian sword and sorcery story with a strong psychedelic component uh, that uh, happens to be Santa Claus themed. And uh, could be connected if one is so inclined uh, to the legend of St. Nicholas. Um, yeah, it's – I can tell that the, the the germ of this story and this idea or the spore of it, if you prefer, uh, comes from uh, an idea that's been circulating and that I'm sure Morrison has read about quite some time ago, uh, suggesting a connection between uh, the beginnings of the legend of the winter gift bringer or Santa Claus or Kris Kringle or, or Debosnickel or whatever you want to call him. Uh, to uh, Nordic, far northern European shamanism involving the sacramental use of psychedelic mushrooms. <laughs> okay, then. Yeah, yeah there's uh, – if you want to read more about or uh, see or watch or listen to more about that, you can go to YouTube and uh, do a search for Santa Claus is a mushroom. <laughs> and uh, you'll see a couple of mushrooms that <laughs> – outline in some detail what I'm talking about. But I'm sure Morrison is familiar with the idea that uh, maybe uh, this idea of a, a man who brings gifts of either toys or knowledge or wisdom or peace and goodwill um, probably originated from the hallucinations of some white-bearded wise folk and uh, tribal healers that existed in the far northern lands and uh, you know, eucharistically consumed forest mushrooms to have hallucinatory visions, you know, visions of sugar plums dancing in their heads, if you will. <laughs> Um, and uh, he does touch on that. Although I, I get the feeling he downplays uh, the uh, sacramental psychedelia aspect a little bit. Uh, you just see uh, the main character, uh, Klaus, uh, consuming a stew of what is obviously mushrooms and then starting to play a little song on his pipe. And then these uh, mystical northern spirits, the Shining family, as he calls them, appear to him. And then things get really wonky and tripped out. Uh, yeah, Dan Mora nearly goes to town with his colors in the next couple of pages, and uh, when Klaus awakes from this little trip that he goes on next morning, he finds that uh, he's made a whole bunch of toys. Okay, then. And uh, yeah. and that, that's about as far as Morrison goes with uh, the, the psychedelic aspect, which I'm pretty sure was probably what inspired the whole thing. But then he fills in the rest with some interesting borrowings from some other uh, you know, storytelling genres you know it's a little bit of uh like a barbarian pulp novel a little bit of superhero comic book and yes a little bit of holiday special because there are certain uh, elements of this story that i'm positive were inspired on one level or another by the rankin bass classic santa claus is coming to town <laughs> like most of the action is set in a northern uh, medieval village called grimsvig which translates pretty nearly exactly to somber town which is the name of the town uh in Santa Claus is coming to town. Uh, but uh, Klaus doesn't have to contend with the Burgermeister Meisterburger in this story. Instead, he has to deal with the um, the wicked, joyless uh, Baron Magnus uh, and uh, the uh, dark demonic force uh, with which he is contracted. And uh, so uh, Klaus, uh, I get the feeling that uh, the story evolved rather rapidly and strangely in Morrison's mind even as he told it because it's, it doesn't feel like it's at all the same story by the end that uh, he set out to tell in the first issue. But it's kind of a fun, crazy ride, um, especially in the final chapter when things get really tripped out and supernatural and uh, <laughs> and we, we, we get to see uh, Klaus uh, after he's been <laughs> – this is something of a spoiler, but he's uh, – kind of remade on a cellular level by the the shining family his his heart is turned to ice he's made basically immortal and unkillable and he's uh, granted a sleigh uh pulled by a team of flying spirit wolves <laughs> which <laughs> drag him uh, out into the northern sky among the stars uh, but yeah so it, it's kind of a he, he's but up to that point uh, before he goes superhuman klaus is kind of portrayed as this robin hood like picaresque uh, folk hero figure. We're told that Klaus translates to victory of the people. Okay. Uh, and so he goes around, uh, he, he distributes toys, and he does other things to try and uh, break uh, the icy grip of the Baron Magnus upon the townsfolk of Grimsvig and uh, you know, save them, and especially save the children from the sinister plans that uh, the Baron and his uh, supernatural ally have in store for them. Won't someone yeah, please think of the children? Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, a couple people do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's. It, it, I, I, I gotta say, I do enjoy it. Uh, the the more I dissociate it uh, in my mind with uh, classical tales of Christmas, the, the 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 better I, the better time I have with it, and the more enjoyable I find it. Um, and it, and Morrison does make this easier for me in that he doesn't mention the word Christmas once. I mean, this is. Uh, it's set in medieval times. Uh, the Christian religion does exist, and it makes a couple of token appearances in the story. Not very complimentary. Uh, it's not very complimentarily portrayed. It, it, it's not shown as evil or corrupt or anything like that. And goodness knows uh, the, the church had uh, – it, it probably could have been uh, with some justification portrayed that way. Um, it, it became kind of – dangerously uh, influential uh, throughout Europe in, in those days. But uh, Morrison kind of just uh, plays it as uh, yet another impotent uh, tool and puppet of uh, of the, the uh, oppressive regime of, of the Baron here in the town. And uh, one of the last scenes in the comic actually is uh, uh, the, the, the steeple of the town church uh, getting – well, destroyed by a large, heavy object crashing through it. But yeah, so anyway, uh, it's not a Christmas story. It's a Yule time story. Um, and some of the traditions do overlap. Of course, there are lit, decorated uh, evergreen trees, and there are big feasts with lots of food and drink, and uh, the children are given gifts of toys. And that makes it all similar enough. And uh, we get lots of interesting action scenes with Klaus uh, you know, battling both the Baron's men and also the... Uh, a dark demonic figure, um, uh, no less associated in ancient European tradition with Christmas than the gift bringer himself. You can probably guess which figure I'm talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, he's he, he's he had his own movie not too long ago. He, he's getting he, he's growing in uh, recognition here in North America mm -hmm. uh, these uh, past uh, several years or decade or so, and uh, he's been written into lots of alternative takes on the Santa Claus myth in comics. And Morrison, of course, doesn't want to miss out on any of that fun, so he throws this character in there as well. Uh, yeah. All in all, I, I I found it an enjoyable read, but uh, it's never going to be my favorite Christmas story, and I'm kind of glad that I uh, chose to read it at, uh, during Halloween season instead of uh, at, at Christmas time. Well, it sounds it sounds like uh, it was the perfect uh, story to bring up on the same episode we talk about Joker. <laughs> you know, like it, yeah. it's it's just it's just it's just one origin story for the for the character, but not necessarily the origin story for the character. Right. He is a multiplicity, and that's what he will always be. <laughs> now, I, I'd love to know if the uh, Klaus animated film that's coming to uh, to Netflix in November has anything to do with Grant Morrison's Klaus, but I, I have a feeling it doesn't. Mm. I'd, I'd, I'll, I'll that, have to look further into that. Is that also going to be uh, kind of a Santa Claus origin story? It is, yes. Uh, and uh, starring Jason Schwartzman, Rashida Jones, J.K. Simmons, and John Cusack. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is it going? To be, uh, did you say it was animated? It is animated. Yes. Uh, hmm. It's right. going to have a short theatrical run, and then after that, go go to Netflix because that's that's the way they do it these days to make sure they wind up getting, uh, you know, uh, Oscar uh, buzz and what have you. So. Hmm. Yeah. I'll have to look into that. But either way, hey, more Klaus. <laughs> yeah. Uh. No, that's not that. I'm I'm glad I'm glad you enjoyed it at least for what it was because I've I've always been interested in Klaus and I was waiting to hear your take on it. Well, my take is uh, one of approval. I, I think it's I, I liked it a lot more than I thought it was going to. I'm I'm kind of fascinated by uh, you know, the setting and uh, I'm kind of sorry that Morrison didn't <laughs> indulge a little bit more in the uh, you know Eucharistic mushroom aspect of things. <laughs> And I've just now found out that the name of the character I was trying to think of was the Night King. Ah, there we go. Uh, yeah, I've I haven't gotten past season three, and uh, no, I'm seeing here that he made his first appearance on the show in season four. So, yep, but, uh, I can be forgiven for blanking on his name. Exactly. Uh, I, I've got one more thing to to bring up, um, and it's sort of related again to things that we discussed because I remember many many New York comics, Comic Cons ago where I hadn't quite grasped the concept of the time bubble, I handed you a copy of Super Dinosaur and asked you to review it on the show. And I, re and I remember you made an exception, quote-unquote, justice once, even though it was nowhere near where you were in your, uh, in your reading 
and and went ahead and reviewed it on the episode, and I still appreciate that. But, no, oh, Ian, I still appreciate the gift of that copy because I can remember very clearly my bus ride back south <laughs> to Tom's River after the convention, and I remember reading that Super Dinosaur issue, and it, it made the trip very pleasant indeed. So very thank good. you again, Ian. The reason I bring it up, uh, I was unaware that there is a animated series for Super Dinosaur. Hmm. Uh, that is premiering, uh, actually just premiered on Amazon Prime Streaming uh, on October 6th. And uh, I, I believe it was, uh, it's a Canadian production, so it premiered there on September 8th. Not sure if it's going to have any sort of, uh, you know, terrestrial airing uh, here in the States. But uh, that is where it is available, and I first heard about it at this New York Comic Con. So I saw that it was, uh, that there was a, uh, a panel about it there but uh good 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 thing to bring to animated i think it's it, it's a mm. it's a nice a, a nice source for material mm. yes i agree it's really it, it kind of felt to me like it should have been an animated series uh, right off right out of the starting gate yep uh, you know one kind of imagines that's maybe what uh, kirkman had in mind for it when he uh, first uh, dreamed it up <laughs> um, but yeah i'm glad that uh, he's uh, getting another uh, kirkman is getting another project uh, onto the uh, uh well, I, I i use the term airwaves only metaphorically obviously <laughs> if it's going to be a a streaming series but yeah. uh, i'm he's he's getting another tv project out there that doesn't involve zombies and i'm glad he's uh, showing his uh, range a little bit as a showrunner yep. and uh, i hope it's well received yep same here, and uh, still looking forward to Invincible, the animated series, which should be coming, I think, sometime early next year, if I remember correctly. So um, he's got tons of animated action going on. Mm. All right. That suits me just fine. And yep. maybe I'll actually get to see some of it. Maybe. All righty. I think that's it for me. Uh, you got anything else? Well, no, but I, like I said, I had one more thing, but I think I'll keep it under my hat for now until Chris is around. It's, it, it plays to one of his uh, favorite series. Okay, then you know what? I'll just ask you one last question. Thoughts on the pariah outfit? Uh, now, now that now that now that we've seen it in in action uh, on the, in some stills from the upcoming Crisis on Infinite Earths uh, crossover. Oh yes, the one that's going to be worn by Tom Cavanaugh. Yes, in it the is. Upcoming Crisis crossover. Yep. Uh, yeah, I had a little bit of a. Dis- it's. <laughs> I've been brought up in a number of uh, Facebook discussions because of that. Actually, <laughs> um, I was talking to. Uh, listener Eric N. Bennett, uh, who goes by uh, Thor L on uh, the CGS forums, and uh, also uh, Darren Knoll, the Rainbow Cloak, uh, evoked my name uh, mm-hmm. when he uh, when when he saw that that, that image uh, of of Kavanaugh in the suit. Um, I think it looks great. Um, I, I also am impressed with the Harbinger outfit, although I, she she does, she really ought to be blonde and uh, have the red helmet on yeah. to complete the the ensemble. But I, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, those publicity photos were probably taken without uh, full hair and makeup applied. So we may yet end up with a a blonde Harbinger and uh, a lavender haired Pariah mm-hmm. <laughs> played by Kavanaugh. I, I, I'm kind of I, I would have rather they uh, had not just uh, reduced Pariah to yet another. Uh, highly eccentric uh, alternate reality Harrison Wells for uh, Kavanaugh to uh, overact on. Um, but uh, the, the costume, at least, uh, looks very uh, true to life. Uh, <laughs> a robot, or as true to life as it can be for a fictional character. Of course, yes. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, but, but, but Perez, just uh, his, his character designs are just uh, the next best thing to real life to me. Yeah. And after all that, uh, those of you out there scratching your heads at why I'm Mentioning my my own name being invoked in a cr- connection to this character, it's not simply that uh, I'm so connected to to Crisis on Infinite Earths as a result of my co-hosting the Crisis tapes with Peter and having written my master's thesis about Crisis. I actually embodied an element of Crisis at one point because at in 2007 at the second uh, New York Comic Con, the low these years ago, um, I actually cosplayed Pariah, you know, purple hair and uh, under the eye circles and everything. Um, really, so, really, yeah, I feel like Pariah has just been cosplaying as you all these years, but that's uh, beside the point. <laughs> uh, wow, that's <laughs> that, that, that is an eerily meta observation, Ian. <laughs> no, I wanted I wanted to check to see if you'd seen what anti monitor looks like since they just revealed that today. Oh no, I have not seen that yet. I'm, I'm okay. sure it's going to be on Facebook someplace. Though. I just I just went ahead it's... and uh, sent the link in our uh, in our Skype chat here. Uh, if you can. Mm. Uh, Click on that uh, thing that looks like a word bubble. It'll open it up, and uh, you can go ahead and click on that link. Okay. Oh, yeah, I see. I see. It does look like a URL. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And is that the same actor? Uh, that is the same actor, yep. That is indeed yeah, the same actor that's playing the monitor. That is a, I'm going to call that a good enough makeup job. <laughs> Yeah, the the the, out, the outfit itself is uh, is nice and uh, is, is nice and evil looking, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I'd say good enough is is right where I put it. It's a little too uh, a little too veiny and apocalypsey for me, but uh, it's mm-hmm. it's it, it's pretty damn close. Yeah, I, I I definitely do see the similarity to Apocalypse. Kind of looks uh, like a, well, whatever the name of the ruler of the White Walkers is too mm-hmm. from Game of Thrones. Good point. Yeah, probably not accidental. <laughs> Yep, but uh, very, very much yep, looking yep. forward to December to see how this thing's going to turn out. Mm. Yes, you and me both, Ian. And maybe Tom Cavanaugh will have uh, purple hair by then. We can only hope. We can only hope. <laughs> if I were Cavanaugh, I'd insist on it. Yeah, I mean, what? He's he's, he's enough of a nerd. He can he can put that in, in his rider or something like that, or put that in the contract. <laughs> like, must must have purple hair, or I'm or I'm walking the set. I'm walking. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. I think our bolt is officially shot at this point. So you ready? You, you ready to wrap us up? Ah, uh, believe it or not, I am. So let's do it. Okay. If you'd like to send us an email, that address is comicgeekspeak at gmail.com, also a good place to send your Muddle the Murd entries. If you'd like to leave a voicemail, you can call 267-702-6642. We still offer that feature. Um, if you'd uh, like to follow us on Twitter, the handle is at comicgeekspeak. You can also like us on Facebook. Uh, we encourage everyone, as always, to visit the comicforums.vanillacommunity.com, which is our forum site where you can uh, leave uh, feedback and remarks about uh, the various topics we've discussed on this and many other episodes of our show and also just engage in uh, fun little conversations not directly related to the podcast with your fellow CGS listeners, friends, and comic geeks. Uh, We'd like to give special thanks also as always to those of you who have uh, supported the show monetarily in the past. We really appreciate it. The show would not be what it is today without your help. And as always, we're uniting the world's mightiest heroes one listener at a time. Laser beams of pain like the